My name is Julie Pearson Little Thunder. I'm with the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at Oklahoma State University, and I'm interviewing George England on behalf of the Shilako Alumni Association. George, you're a Cherokee tribal member, a Shilako alum, class of 1953. Yes, ma'am. A member of the Shilako Board of Directors, where you've held several offices, as well as being the current president of the Southwest chapter. Yes, ma'am. You're also a military veteran. We'll be talking about some of your Shilako memories today, as well as your military service. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me. Thank you. Where were you born and where did you grow up? I was born in Pitcher, Oklahoma, the back door of Oklahoma. And uh, we were just in northeast Oklahoma over oh, several years. My uh, parents worked in the printing industry, and uh, they were in uh, Cardin, Oklahoma, uh, Pryor, Oklahoma. And uh, while there, I attended elementary school at both of those places. What did your, you explain what your mother and father did for a living? Did you have any brothers or sisters? And where were you in the lineup? Uh, my, my father, uh, at one time when I was real young, uh, he was a miner and just did different things. Mm -hmm. uh, a cowboy working for the 101 Ranch in Oklahoma, working as a, as a cowboy in Wyoming. So he just had multiple jobs, but he ended up probably around 1943 working as a printer at uh, Pitcher, Oklahoma, and then Pryor, Oklahoma. Then he uh, got a job at Chihuahua Indian School as an, as an assistant instructor of printing. Uh, all during this time, my mother, she uh, was a homemaker or started working in uh, just clerical work, just to start off with. Mm -hmm. Later on, uh, they both went into, in, in, into printing as an instructor at Chilaco. Uh, my mother also worked at the administration building for Superintendent Ellie Correll, mm -hmm. and also worked for Charles Laughlin, who was the uh, CPA for Chilaco. Mm -hmm. And then one of her duties at that time was to take care of all the veterans who was coming back from World War II in the postgraduate program. Mm -hmm. and, and all this time I was there with them. <laughs> do, you, do you have any brothers or sisters? I have uh, one brother, Leon, that uh, is deceased. He died, uh, uh, he was three years younger than myself. I was born in 1935, he was born in 1938. And he had a little medical problem, and he and he passed away in 1999, I think it was. Mm -hmm. uh, I had one sister that died at, uh, shortly after birth. My brother's name was Leon. My sister's name was Virgie May. Mm -hmm. uh, what was your exposure to Cherokee language and culture growing up? Uh, Growing up, I can still remember uh, my father and four of his brothers and two sisters and my grandparents uh, in Grove, Oklahoma. I can still see them sitting around a big pot-bellied stove in the living room, all talking Cherokee. And uh, then uh, Every once in a while, they would all giggle, look at, look and point at me, and say Scotty Yonek, which was a little white boy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they they all spoke Cherokee. What? Uh, where did you go to school prior to coming to Chilaco? Uh, I can remember going to a grade school, probably from grade one at uh, a, uh, a little bitty village uh, between Commerce, Oklahoma and Pitcher, Oklahoma called White Bird. And I remember the grade school there that we walked to the school and back. Uh, next, my father took a job at Pryor, Oklahoma as a printer. Then I was in the elementary school at Pryor. And then in 1944, my father took a job with Wichilaco Indian School. And then uh, 
I entered their elementary school at Chalaco, probably in the third or fourth grade, about 1944-45. So what was it like being, you know, basically being raised on the campus grounds here at Chalaco? Well, it was kind of fun, really, because I got to uh, see all of the, the Chalaco students uh, back in the 40s, and most other students, unless they were graduates in the in the late mid to late 40s, they they knew each other. But the uh, Chalaco students of my era and later did not get the chance to meet and see any of them. But there were some fantastic athletes. Uh, it was a little different there, I mean, going to school. Uh, and that was our, our home. But, but when we grew up, of course, we were at the school, and that's different than growing up in a suburb city now, where there's cars and, and contacts and everything, because that's all we had was Shawaka. And we would go play tennis on the tennis courts or go down to the gym and shoot baskets. But, but it, was, it was a good, wholesome life. And watch, watch the students also play and, basketball And watch the students. Or... Uh, but probably the thing I remember most is the Shalako boxing teams. Okay. Uh, and they were fantastic, some of the best boxers in the state. Mm -hmm. uh, they, always had a, uh, they always had some knockdown drag outs with Fort Sill Indian School, the Telsa Boxing Club, the Oklahoma City Boxing Club. And the, and the uh, state golden gloves and the national tournaments. There was always Schlafel boxers uh, that were very famous. But that was, I still remembered, I still remember seeing that gym set up in the boys' gymnasium. Right, yeah. right. So um, as you were coming up through Schlafel yourself, getting a little bit older into middle school and, and high school, you were still living. Um, on campus, you were living in your home rather than in one of the dormitories. Well, we started off, I, I can remember when when we first got there in 1944, all we had was an apartment and it was real crowded. It was uh, really one bedroom and, uh, and one uh, makeshift bedroom, you might say. And uh, myself and my brother uh, was in there, plus at that time, uh, one of my cousins come to live with us because my my father's uh, brother and his and his sister-in-law had passed away. Mm -hmm. So one of their kids come to live with us, and and they didn't adopt him, but he was there, and his name was Sequoia, mm -hmm. and he was three months older than I was. But uh, we started off in an apartment. We moved to another apartment, and then probably sometime around 1948 or. 47, somewhere in there, uh, we moved into a, a house mm -hmm. at Schlocko on the west side of the campus. So okay. we were in that house. Um, what was one of the te teachers or classes that stood out for you at Schlocko? Well, probably the one that stood out was Vivian Heyman, uh, who was the consumer education teacher. And I can still remember her saying things like, Whenever you buy a shirt, make sure it's got seven buttons on it. If it, if it doesn't have seven buttons down the front, it's not, it's not a good shirt. And on ties, uh, there was always some threading on the back of the ties that we were supposed to look to uh, see if the, the threading was there. Plus, uh, she monitored and proofread all of the... She was also the journalism teacher. and. Uh, and so she was in charge of the school annual, the school newspaper, and, uh, and that was fun in her class, on the journalism classes and the consumer education. That was probably my favorite. Did you work on the journal then? Uh, I worked on the journal uh, as a printing student and also as an editorial section. Great. Um, any other areas that you were particularly interested in, in terms of subjects or study? Uh, well, I like phys ed, obviously. And, Did you uh, play some sports? I played basketball there uh, all four years, and finally my senior year I started, made all-conference team, uh, played baseball, and went out for football, but I was pretty little then. I was like, I remember one time when I was on the freshman football team, 
uh, I tackled one of the varsity halfbacks in, in a practice, and the coach got real upset with his James Choate, saying that such and such, you let that 95-pound ring and wet boy tackle you. But uh, it was fun. I mean, athletics, I mean, I enjoyed athletics. Uh, also like math, I liked uh, mathematics and algebra. And uh, that was probably my two most favorite subjects. Mm -hmm. But uh, just being in the whole education system there was, was fun and exciting. Um, what happened after you graduated from Shilako? After I graduated from Shilako, I uh, uh, worked that summer to get some money. Uh, I had a basketball scholarship to Graceland College in Lamoni, Iowa, and uh, I went there for uh, the next year and played basketball and run track in, in Iowa. Uh, and then during the summers I would work in print shops around Arkansas City, Ponca City, Tonka Wall, Wichita, because uh, at that time I was a very accomplished linotype operator wow. and, and it was easy for me to get, get a good summer job. Uh -huh. so. um, after you graduate, did you graduate from Graceland or did you? No, I went there one year and then uh, uh, my cousin Sequoia went with me but we decided not to go back the next year. Uh, we wanted to go to school a little closer to home, and so we both went to Arkansas City Junior College that next year. And what was your focus there? Uh, my focus there was really just trying to get through the, get through school. Uh, at, at that time, we could not use calculators in in the classes for like chemistry and and uh, higher math. Uh, we, I mean, all the kids were using slide rules, uh, but uh, we never learned in how to use a slide rule of Schlocko. That just wasn't in our curriculum. So we were kind of behind in math because we was having to do our math by longhand. Uh, but uh, we both dropped out at the first, after the first semester of our second year of college. Mm -hmm. And uh, my cousin Sequoia joined the Navy. Uh, I went to work, and uh, uh, I was just ready to go to work at that right. time. And uh, and later on that summer in in July of 1955, I think it was, I joined the service because I was ready to go in the army. And what what uh, motivated you to join? Well, it just seems like that most of the Indian boys and the and the people we hung around with. Uh, they were all patriotically inclined, and I mean, it, it, it just seems like uh, once us guys graduated from Shilako, okay, uh, we either migrated to Oklahoma City or Tulsa, because that's a, our first exposure to a large city, and, and growing up and having fun, and or if you didn't do that, you joined the service. And most of the guys that I knew, uh, some of them on the board here at Chilaco, uh, it, it, you were joined either the paratroopers or you joined the Marines. Mm -hmm. uh, that seemed to be the thing to do. And you joined the paratroopers. Yes, ma'am, I did. I, I was a volunteer for the paratroopers. Um, what was the response from your, your folks in your community when you... Um, they was happy for me. Mm -hmm. uh, they knew I was going to do it, and, and they really never inter interfered that much. Uh, they just uh, wanted was wanting to know um, was I happy in doing that. Mm -hmm. And I can still remember uh, when I graduated from the first eight weeks of basic training in Fort Carson, Colorado, Colorado Springs, uh, when we were getting out of that first eight weeks and, and graduating from basic, so to speak, uh, I didn't know how I was going to get home on leave before my next assignment. And then all of a sudden, uh, our drill sergeant says, England, uh, the old man wants to see you. Well, normally you would think the old man was the company commander of your training unit and you was going to be in trouble. But it turns out the old man that I saw was my dad. 
<laughs> and he, could, he come all the way from Oklahoma to pick me up and drive me home. <laughs> so, uh, so they were happy, I, I think, for me. And later on, like some of my other stations, like in Kentucky, uh, they would show up to take pictures of the signs and stuff like that. Oh, how so neat. It yeah, was fun. Support. Mm -hmm. um, what about your Shalako background do you think help, helped you with boot camp? Uh, discipline. Because at Shalako, it's not like the kids in school now where uh, after school's out, they got their cars, they can go do different things. We didn't have cars or anything at school. I mean, uh, you either had like maybe 45 minutes to an hour of social time in, on the middle of the campus, uh, and then uh, you went you went to the dormitories before your supper, or if, if you went to practice if you were in athletics or the girls and cheerleading practice. But it was really a pretty structured life at Chilocco. Mm -hmm. And uh, dating was different. I mean, uh, for the Saturday night dance or the Saturday night movies, uh, you could all march or file down to the girls' dormitories and pick up your girl and all walk to the dance or to the movies. So it was, it was pretty disciplined mm -hmm. most of the time. And, and that was a help in the service because I never got in trouble or anything. Were there some drawbacks about coming from that environment into boot camp? Well, we were. I mean, it, it was a it was a process where you had to get used to, it, you know, and like uh, having to shine your boots every day and 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 go on KP in the mess hall all day long. I mean, or you were forced to do something that wasn't nice, but it was it was all necessary as a part of of, of your military life and but it didn't take long to get used to it I mean because we were still proud to be in the service right right were there any other native soldiers in boot camp with you uh, well I saw uh, at one time uh, one of the Walden boys and there was a lot of Waldens that went to Shalako and this was Don Walden he shows up uh, one time and enters in my barracks my barracks room and he says, where's England at? And I look up there and it's Don Walden. Now he was a couple of years younger than I was, but I saw him uh, during my jump school training at Fort Bragg. Uh, went down to the PX one night to get buy some toothpaste and, and uh, just hang out there to kill time. And lo and behold, I saw four Shalako students that I knew. Leroy Saki Estawood, David Secondine, Don Beaver, and one of the Burris boys. And they were all sitting at a table, <laughs> but they were getting real close to getting discharged. But I hadn't even been to jump school yet, and so I didn't have my parachute badge wings on yet. And boy, did they let me have it because <laughs> they all were jumpers and I wasn't. And so I had to buy them beer all that night until I finally left and went back to my <laughs> barracks. But, uh, but I did see some some other Shalako students throughout my, throughout my military life. You know, um, I'm not sure, you know, you mentioned there's this attraction to jump school mm -hmm. and not, uh, you know, you, you need to sort of not have a fear of heights for one thing, I would think. What, what was your experience doing your first jump? My first jump, I mean, it was all a blur. I mean, None of us knew what to expect, and um, we had fear of heights. We had fear of, of having a, par a parachute malfunction. I mean, it was always there in the back of your mind. But, but uh, we were jumping out of C-119s, and there was two lines, or sticks as we called them, 22 people on each side, and uh, about one about about every second you would would funnel down to the exit doors at the back of the plane and and when you got there you didn't have time to think about anything it, all of a sudden you were in the door and boom you were gone mm -hmm. and then you were so thankful after four seconds you would look up and hopefully your parachute was opening up 
So that was a relief when you looked up and after four seconds your parachute was open, then you had the nice, beautiful, quiet, lovely ride for 55 seconds down to your landing area. And you was hopeful that there wasn't a big gust of wind where it would interfere with, with your landing. Right. But, but it was quite the thing. And, and you probably, had you been on a plane prior to that? You know, I've never had that question asked of me before, but I don't think I'd been on an airplane before. I, I, I don't think I had. It was always trains or buses or cars. How about the training that you did for, for the jump? Do you remember a, a funny or kind of just memorable moment in your training? Well, my, my best friend, the one that uh, when I first went in, uh, I joined the Ponca City and, uh, and they, they sent us by train or, or bus, I can't remember now, up to Kansas City. And when we were in Kansas City, this was kind of strange really, but there was about 500, I'm guessing 500, uh, of us guys that was in this big room by the, by the Union Station in Kansas City. And we were all getting, getting in, inducted into the Army, where we raise our hand and say we're going to be good soldiers and all of that stuff but there was 500 of us. But we had to take our shirts off for some kind of a brief physical. And they come around with a big red stick, like a tuba lick stick, and they would and they would write on our chest, and it was either R-A or U-S or A-B-N. Well, we would, I mean, you're looking around the room and everybody's got something on their chest. Well, lo and behold, out of, of all these guys that are there, okay, only four of us had ABN on our chest. Everybody else had RA or US. Well, now we remember that the RA stood for regular army. These were the volunteers. The US was the draftees because the draft, the, the United Selective Service draft was still in effect. Mm -hmm. But the ABN, the four of us kind of found each other when we walked around. And we were saying, what the heck is ABN? Are, are we different or something? And one guy finally said, I think that means airborne. So there were four of us there that had joined the airborne. And so that kind of started our experience in there. But one of the guys, uh, his name was David Parker from Tonganoxie, Kansas. His father was the lone doctor in town. Wow. But we stayed together the whole three years. I mean, we we stayed together. We just it just worked out that way. And I can remember our very first jump. He was on the opposite side of the plane, looking straight at me, and he started sweating. And boy, you could tell he was really scared. Mm -hmm. And I can remember looking over at him, and I was scared too, but I didn't want him to know it. Mm -hmm. And I just said, David, everything's going to be fine. He said, Okay. Anyways, but uh, David and I st uh, stayed together the whole four years or three years. Wow. Okay. Um, what did you think of your officers there? Uh, like the officers, uh, uh, the 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 senior officers, the like the captains and the and the majors and stuff. They were all veterans, you know, maybe 10, 15, 20 year veterans that had been to Korea. For the Second World War, but most of them had been to Korea, and uh, but the the lieutenants were really younger officers that were uh, out of West Point or they'd been to OCS Officer Candidate School, but uh, I didn't have a problem with them, and uh, they tried to get me to go to OCS. I had uh, good enough grades to go, but no, I wanted to be an infantry man. I wanted to be a grunt in the paratroopers, so <laughs> so I chose not to. Now, uh, did you ever, did you go overseas at all? Never did. Uh, I was always at uh, either Fort Bragg, North Carolina for jump mm -hmm. school and basic training there. Mm -hmm. um, then we got uh, transferred, our whole unit that I was assigned to after jump school. We got assigned or uh, transferred to Fort Campbell, Kentucky, mm -hmm. where we reactivated the 101st Airborne Division again. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I stayed there the whole time. The only uh, horse we went on several exercises, mm -hmm. 
where we would go maybe to Fort Polk, Louisiana, or some big major major exercise and training and everything. Uh, it was kind of infantry training was what I was in. Mm-hmm. And then uh, uh, then I got, I, I, pl- I played basketball, played baseball with the service teams. Uh, and I guess the best time I had was when uh, the bandmaster of the 187th Airborne Regimental Combat Team, I guess checked all my records and entry forms and found out I'd played in a band at Shalako. I was in the Shalako band. And then he asked me, or he called me up to his office one day at uh, uh, Fort Campbell, and he said, England, he said, uh, how would you like to be in the division band? I said, no, nah, I don't think so. I think I just, I like being where I'm at in the infantry over there. He says, trust me, you don't want to be in the infantry. You really want to be in the band. <laughs> and I said, okay, I'll take your judgment. So basically for the next two and a half years, I did play in the division band. What instrument? Uh, I played clarinet. Uh-huh. And that was quite the exciting thing because we would always go to uh, college games and perform at halftime or we would go to the Cherry Blossom Festival in Washington uh, or parades in Nashville, whatever. It was quite exciting, and uh, but I never got overseas. It was, it was during 1955 to 19, mm-hmm. late 1958, and that was really when there was the Cold War, was so right. to speak, mm-hmm. and there wasn't any major conflicts or anything. Right. Of course, we were always in training. We were always on alert, right. anticipating we would go. But uh, it was just the timing that I was in. Well, you did go as part of the 101st Airborne to um, help protect the Little Rock Nine students. <clears throat> Can you talk about that? Uh, we didn't. We didn't know anything at all about Little Rock mm-hmm. or the students because we didn't read newspapers in the service. I mean, I mean, pretty much uh, you were just up in the morning for your training and hang out with your with your friends and your unit. And, training purposes and then go to bed, wait for the next day. Now one day, uh, we thought we was gonna make a jump. So they tell us we're gonna make a jump. And so we get the whole unit together. And uh, in this case, it wasn't the whole unit, it was just several. And so we went out to Campbell Air Force Base where we thought we was gonna go make a jump. Well, we actually, get on the planes and usually once we get on a plane it's usually a 5 10 15 minute ride and then until we go over the drop zones and then we would all unload the plane and make our jump this time here we didn't we didn't jump we just kept a riding and i can't remember all the exact details but it was probably over an hour or so we were actually in flight going down to little rock arkansas but we didn't know that so we finally land and we said, huh, we didn't jump. So we finally land and deplane and get on some of those two and deuce and halves, we call them, which was two and a half ton trucks with the canvas backing on it. And, uh, and you, you could. Still no idea where no, you're no, going. I, or what no, you're doing. So we just got on that and we knew we was going somewhere, but uh, one of our buddies sticks his head out the back and he said, hey, we're in Arkansas because he saw an Arkansas highway sign. And so shortly thereafter, we, we uh, get off of the trucks at, at uh, Central High School, and we find out that we're there for a riot training, okay, and uh, uh, help integrate the Little Rock Nine, they called them, which was nine coloreds or black people, uh, students, and, and uh, they was anticipating some trouble and we was there to maintain order and help protect the kids in uh, in, in, Rock, or in integrating Central High School in Little Rock. Mm-hmm. And I think I was there probably two months, three months, or so, I, I can't remember the exact dates now. Mm-hmm. And then we went back to Fort Campbell after we got it done. What was it like on the day that the students came to school for the first day? Uh, the problem wasn't in, in the kids. The problem was the parents. Uh, I mean, we didn't have any kind of riot training whatsoever. I mean, this was all new to us, and 
this is something that the 101st and the 82nd Airborne Divisions were, were doing at that time. They were always on alert, ready to go somewhere. And uh, so basically, uh, uh, we put bayonets on our M1 rifles, and uh, we just had the line, and, and uh, the parents tried to take our weapons from us and tried to penetrate our lines, and, and it was... It wasn't. It was. It was an experience, but the, the, the thing, that, and I still remember, is during the day we we had conflicts with the parents, but at night the kids would come around to our pup tents and pick us up and take us into town to go get cokes or convenience stores. Or we were all too young to drink, so it was just it was just hanging out with the kids, and then they would bring us bring us back. Uh, so we can make bed check. Uh, they didn't. So uh, talking about kids, you mean high school students? Yeah, yeah high school coming. students, and you know, and, the, and and so we had a great relationship with them. They was glad to see us, and uh, it was the parents that was giving us problems. So. Were you ever worried that that there was actually going to be a riot that the crowd would sort no, of? No, I was probably not that smart. I mean, the the thing. I mean, it was just what we did. You know, mm -hmm. we were just there. And, and didn't think about it really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, how about after you got out of the service? What did you do? Uh, after I got out of the service, I went back to a printing job. Uh, I actually took a job at the Independence Ex Examiner in uh, Independence, Missouri, as a linotype operator, and uh, went to work up there probably for five or six or seven months, I can't remember. I got out of the service in May of 1958. Uh, got back to Shilako, uh, tried to find some of my friends that I grew up with, the employees' kids, mm -hmm. but most of them were all gone. Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, it's time to go to work and get some money, because I didn't have any money. Boy, had there been changes that you noticed at the school when you came back? No, not really. I mean, okay. it was still the same old school. Home ones, two and three were still there, which which are now gone. But the school was the same, except I just didn't know anybody. Right. And, but I uh, went to Independence, Missouri, uh, in the printing. Stayed there till probably about December. Then I decided to go back to school at Arkansas City Junior College. And so that's where I'd left the first semester in 55, I guess it was. So I went back to Ark City and uh, went, to, went to school that semester and graduated in 1959 from Ark City Junior College. With a degree in? Uh, in degree in, I, I think it was just kind of a liberal arts degree, arts mm -hmm. and sciences, I believe, because mm -hmm. I didn't really have a major at that time. But that's where I met my future wife, Beverly, uh -huh. uh, Beverly Gordon. She was from Wichita. And uh, so then after I got out of school, I went back to Independence and uh, went back to work again for the, for the examiner. And then uh, uh, later on, I got married later on, my wife and I, met the next year. And then um, at some point you went to the University of Missouri. Uh, well, and I, and I, I worked for quite a while because uh, we had four kids, and so that meant I had to keep having money come in. But all the, all the time I was either working nights at the Kansas City Star as a union printer, but I was going to school sometime during the days whatsoever. Um, but. My wife's parents had moved to Long Beach, California, and she was real close to her parents in Wichita. And this was 1962. We'd been married probably about uh, three years. Uh, we talked about it, and, and so we decided to go to California because her sister was out there in Torrance. Uh, her folks were in Torrance. So we pack up and uh, I think we had we had two kids at that time, born in '61 and '62. My two oldest sons. So we go to California for two years. Two years was all we could take in California, and so we moved back to Kansas City. 
but the time we were in California, uh, it was an ideal situation for me. I would work nights at the Long Beach Press Telegram or the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, and I would work there at nights. And then during the day, I would go to Long Beach State, Long Beach State University. Okay. I didn't graduate from there, but I got real close. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, so that was my experience at Long Beach State. Then, when I got, we went back to uh, um, Independence, and from there, uh, I enrolled at University of Missouri, Kansas City. And then, uh, that's where I got my degree from, from the four-year school. Right. Eventually, as I understand it, you started your own business. Um, when I got out of school, uh, I think I graduated one in 1969, I think it was, somewhere about there. And I got out of school, and I was 33 years old when I got my degree, and we was all proud and celebrating that. And I was probably one of the oldest ones in my class. But anyway, uh, I decided to try law school. So I enrolled at the UMKC School of Law. And I actually went to law school uh, that first year, 1969 or 70. And uh, while there, uh, I was still working nights at the Star. And so my college dean really didn't like that because he basically wanted me to spend all my uh, free time in the law library. And I can understand that, but I had to go earn a living. Okay, and so I, I really worked and went to law school and helped my wife raise some kids. Well, when I started looking around uh, at all the law school students in our classes, I mean, it seemed like most of them, their fathers were lawyers or, or they were officers in a bank or they were officers and everything. And I just thought, really, right or wrong, I saw handwriting on the wall that if I ever get out of law school in two more years, after three years, uh, I'm just going to be a little law clerk somewhere and it's going to be rough on me. And uh, I decided, no, I think I'll enter into the business world. Mm -hmm. And so my wife and I talked it over and so I applied for a job uh, with Maryland Casualty Insurance Company. Got the job and that started my insurance career. Well, um, and eventually you specialized in when you opened your own. I got the job with Maryland Casualty, and then uh, uh, I had some offers from uh, some of our agents. One was in Dodge City, Kansas, that wanted me to leave Maryland Casualty and go to Dodge City. But I said, no, I'm not quite ready for that because my oldest son was wrestling for Truman High School in, in Independence. And he said, Dad, I don't want to go to Dodge City. He says, I'm a good wrestler, and, I, and all my friends are in, uh, in in school here, and so all the other kids told me the same thing. So, so we just stayed there, and after probably three years with Maryland Casualty, uh, I had an offer from INA, the insurance company in North America, as a senior underwriter, and it was a nice raise for me and uh, a nice position, and I took that job. While with the INA, I was a casualty underwriter, meaning that uh, uh, personal accounts, homeowners, automobile, business accounts, you know, general insurance, bonds, whatever, uh, uh, that was my position. But one of our major agencies we dealt with, and, uh, and the business they did, was Land Speed Insurers out of uh, Shawnee Mission, Kansas. And they specialized in auto racing insurance for speedways and drivers. And, uh, and anyway, so I thought that fascinating and uh, I developed a really good rapport because they would have to bring submissions into me and it was my job to underwrite them if the bleachers were safe or whatever, you know, to accept that, that after a while they really valued my input and they, they offered me a job with the uh, leaving the INA and going to an insurance agency. Well, again, it was a nice raise and that was, that was welcomed by me and my wife to help us raise the kids. 
And uh, but anyway, after that was probably 1977. But after about five or six years, he decided to sell his agency. The owner decided to sell his agency to our number one competitor. And at the time, we were like like Avis and our competitors was the Hertz. They were they were the class. And uh, anyway, so he decides to sell his agency and that throws all of our employees or his employees in a tizzy. What are we going to do now? Well, essentially they were gone. And uh, one of the insurance companies that, that he, he had under contract was Cigna, which is the, uh, uh, actually, the life insurance company in North America, and which I knew of them because of my deals with INA. And so they called me up one day and they said, George, we don't like what's going down about we're going to be gone because uh, your boss has actually sold his agency to uh, his competitor and our competitor. And so all of the money that he's been sending in for premium, which was over a million dollars a year, it's going to be going bye-bye. He says, why don't you start your own agency and as an insurance company, we'll handle that book of business for you and we'll help you set your agency up. And uh, I've never had, I mean, I've always worked for the other man as an employee and uh, talked about it. He says, this is what we want to do. Well, they put me on a plane, sent me back to Philadelphia and explained what they wanted to do, which was a couple of days later after that phone call. Well, to make a long story short, about two weeks later, I'm incorporated and it's got business cards made up and everything. And I'm on my way to Daytona Beach uh, for a, a major insurance conference down there with all the agencies there and, and all the, uh, the, the the speedways there during speed weeks in the Daytona 500. and. Uh, Anyway, so I'm on my way down there, and, and the first year, uh, I ended up with 25 accounts. Wow. Um, and and in, night, in 2006, when we actually shut, uh, shut our agency down and retired, uh, we had over 550 accounts. My goodness. But, uh, but anyway, that, that was that. And, and did and, you become a fan of speed racing? Uh, I'm not too sure I was ever a fan, but it was our, but it was but our life. Oh yeah. yeah, and oh, I knew them all. I mean, we insured uh, Richard Petty and and the Wall Trips and, oh, wow. and Dick Trickle, and we knew all the people in NASCAR. But basically, our bread and butter was the little weekly weekly speedways right. uh, around different tracks, and we also insured the drivers and all that stuff. But it was quite the thing because. We were our own bosses. We could do what we wanted to do, and right. and if we wanted to go watch races in in Washington or Pennsylvania, well, we just load up and go. But anyway, <laughs> it, it was exciting, and uh, it was probably one of the best things I ever did was to get into that. That's wonderful. Um, today, are you a member of any Native veterans groups? Um, I'm a tribal member of the Cherokee tribe. And uh, of course, we have we have uh, our own chapter that I helped found, mm -hmm. the Great Southwest Chapter, which actually is the Xalapa Greater uh, Chapter of New Mexico, and it's centered around New Mexico and Arizona. Mm -hmm. uh, that we do uh, really focusing in on the Navajos and the Hopis mm -hmm. uh, because there was a huge amount of of the Navajos that went to school at the, at the shop. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to focus our efforts on on uh, getting them somewhere to, to go and to, to help us organize and to meet their summers and stuff. Right. Why are the Shalapa reunions important to you? It just seems like it's, you can't get away from Shalapa. I mean, uh, and it's. I just enjoy my my time with the with the association, uh, going to reunions, and, and it seems like most of the students migrate back to our reunions, and especially since we have had our last several reunions here at the Seven Clans First Council uh, Resort Hotel and Museum and, and Casino. 
because it's right next door to Schlock. And we were always going out there to uh, just remember uh, our memories and everything and just see the school again. Uh, but it, it's just hard to get away. Um, and how about the Chilapa veterans, specifically that group getting together? Why is that important to you? Uh, well, we just talk about service because uh, we were at Chilapa together and playing ball together with each other or in classmates, whatever. And, and we, we just share military experiences, Chilapa experiences with them. Uh, but like Leroy Sakiestawa, who graduated in 1952, uh, we wear our hats, we, we talk to each other, we share stories. And, uh, and it's just nice to get back once a year and to see people. But, but our Great Southwest chapter, we usually meet three or four times a year. And we look forward to those meetings either in Tucson or Flagstaff or Farmington or Albuquerque. Right. And even though it does take time to go to those places, to me, from Kansas City, to kind of put the meetings together, uh, I, st I wouldn't have it any other way. I mean, it's fun to do that. And even though you don't live in area, in that area, you saw a need for a Southwest chapter, yes. which was why you organized that. Yep, that's, that's what we did because uh, it gives them a way to keep in touch with Schlock and they all want, want to do that. Right, right. Um, you, you've been nominated for the Cherokee Patriot Medal, and um, of course you haven't heard the final word yet, but um, what do you think is, um, what, what makes, um, you know, diff different tribal nations and their attitudes towards veterans, what what makes it a little bit different from the mainstream attitude? Well, I've always, I've always thought that all the tribes, the Pawnee tribes and the Cherokees and the Choctaws, Ponkawas, I mean, all the tribes, they just seem to have a greater appreciation towards veterans. and. One of the things that you see is is always the gourd dancing, mm -hmm. and the gourd dancing was started, I believe, by the Pawnees that welcomed soldiers back from World War II. Okay, and then they would have the gourd dances to welcome them back, and it seems like it's always been the same. And uh, they just appreciate the veterans, mm -hmm. and it makes you feel good that somebody has always recognized you. Of course, we've all heard the stories about the, the veterans coming back from the Vietnam War and getting spit on and stuff like that. But, uh, but that was with a different class of people that did that. But it never happened with our friends and the tribes. It just seems like it's, uh, we appreciate it and I'm sure they appreciate us too. What would you like people to know or remember from your story? Uh, how proud I am of, of being a Schlafel graduate and uh, and just hope our memories of the school will never go away that we'll always have a chance to come back and reminisce talk about the things that happened there and us growing up and uh, sharing our experiences with other students uh, staying with them in the dormitories and just hanging out together and and it, it's it's an experience I'll never forget and, uh, and I'm sure all the other people feel the same way. Is there anything we haven't talked about that you'd like to cover? No, not really. It, uh, uh, except uh, uh, I was proud to be the valedictorian when I was at school. And uh, looking at everything now is that uh, our education was different from what the kids are getting now in school. I mean, they're, they're actually getting calculus and, and engineering classes, but we were just doing the basic things like arithmetic and math and English and learning the, uh, you know, the grammar, you know, and the, the English language and structuring. And, uh, but 
seemed like we never had homework to do. I mean, I can't remember doing homework or anything. But we were busy, but we were learning things. But, but it's a little, it was a little different then as to what the kids are doing now. And uh, like I said, I remember going to college that first year at Graceland, and people were using slide rules and all of that stuff. And I said, oh my gosh, you know. I said, what's that do? It says, well, it multiplies for us, and so forth. But uh, it was a whole different experience and one I'll never forget. Well, thank you, George, for your time today, and thank you for your service to our country, too. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you.